Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Quelch. Having Dominic Barton with us, who is the global managing partner of uh, McKinsey. And we're going to uh, take uh, some minutes for three or four questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So welcome, Dominic. Uh, is, this, is this your first time in uh, Gabon? Or? First time in, in Gabon. Terrific. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, welcome. Um, let me ask you first, um, McKinsey, wonderful, well-established, uh, respected global institution. What does it take to be elected as the global managing partner of McKinsey? Um, what, 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 what sort of skills do you need to lead a global professional organization like this? To be, to be honest, I don't know, because we, <laughs> we, it, it, we it's a voting system where people just vote and there's no campaigning allowed, so it just right. happens. And I, I, I think my own interpretation, if, if I look at who I voted for, uh, which wasn't me and other people. It's, I think it's looking for people who are global. They lived in different countries in the world, experienced different places. Um, I, I, for example, spent about 12 years in Asia uh, before um, taking on this role. Uh, I think it's also people who are uh, curious about how the world is changing, because I think we're living in incredibly different times. I think the next 20 years are going to be an incredible period of time for humanity. So curiosity and ability to want to change. I think you have to want to change an organization. Every organization has to change. In a place like McKinsey, we, uh, we don't like taking our own medicine, I've discovered, so we love to tell other people what they should do, but we don't like to sort of okay. take it ourselves. <clears throat> and it's a partnership, so we have 1,500 partners, and those 1,500 partners feel, and I think it's great, act like CEOs, if you will, so they don't like to be told what to do, uh, and I don't. So. How you make change in a partnership where you have, you know, strong leaders, strong-minded leaders is something you, ha you sort of have to learn how to do, I guess. Okay. Yeah. So if, if you're thinking about your own period uh, in this role, what, right. what is your vision for the change that you think you'd like to bring to McKinsey? Uh, obviously, you have to bring everyone along with you, but what is it that you have as your main vision? Right. Where does McKinsey need to go? Well, I, I, there's a couple of aspects I'm keen on. One is I, and this may seem trite in a way, but I want us to be uh, the most relevant institution, if you will. That means that we're working on the most important issues uh, globally, but also locally. There are obviously areas we can't work on. We, we shouldn't be involved in the Israeli-Palestinian peace discussions. We're not capable of, of a, a lot of things on the political side. But on big issues that are out there, we should have a point of view and we should help. We're an independent, completely global uh, organization, private, uh, so we have the ability to be able to have views. And we, we hire, we try to hire the best people in the world and train them so they should work on it. So being relevant is important. And, and I think that sets the stage for how I at least think we need, we need to change. One is that uh, the world is obviously moving much more towards the emerging markets, right? We're going to have 2.2 billion middle-class consumers in the next 20 years. And I think for any company that's, we, we started in the United States, uh, we're in Europe in, in a big way. If we want to be a relevant institution by 2020, we have to be very significant in places like Africa, uh, in places all over Asia, in Central uh, Asia, Latin America. And so how do we shift our weight, if you will, of the firm to these emerging markets, which right. are going to be, and that's what we've been doing. So, so if, yeah. fr from your experience in China and in uh, Korea, um, what lessons do you think uh, African economies that are trying to make that same kind of transition can learn from what you observed in uh, Asia? Well, I think there's a, a couple of dimensions of it. One is actually on the governance side. I mean, I think one of the secrets to the Chinese success model is the strength of the bureaucracy. I mean, the, the very first meeting I went to in China, where we, 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 it's public knowledge we were serving the mayor of Shanghai, was to watch this. This is in 1995. And the whole meeting was around KPIs. The, the vice mayor was lecturing with a little red communist scarf, the, 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 the management team in the city about the key performance indicators that they had to hit. It was GDP growth, it was the number of jobs that were going to be created, it was the number of schools that had to be built, it was the low-income housing, very tangible focus. And so you have a, 
you have governance, if you will, and a, and a civil service that's very driven and gets things done. Uh, and that's, that's, I think, that is the big difference. So when people, you know, I'm, I'm spending more and more time in Africa, uh, when, I, when people say, well, which are the countries that you want to look, which are the priority countries, in my view, I'd start with the ability to get things done, the, the delivery uh, side of things. I think the second is the private sector. I mean, the innovation that's gone on in China, the ambition uh, from companies. What One small example, uh, I remember Peter Ma, who runs Ping On Insurance, who I think you yes, know from yes. Shanghai, he started out in 1989, uh, he was the driver for the China Merchants Group, right? And the China Merchants Group had just been allowed to come back into existence after the opening up. And they were given an insurance license, and the chairman basically sort of handed out the ability to sell insurance to different employees. Turned out that this driver sold the most insurance, not, not you know, 200 policies. So he said, guess what? You're becoming the CEO of the insurance company. And this guy built uh, an insurance company of some massive significance, now 450,000 employees, a market cap of about $55 billion, and it was ambition. It was that he was the first CEO in China to go to Taiwan. This is before it was open to, for a benchmark trip to look at where people are going. So there was a, getting a business, the business community to, to rise up, if you will, and play a role, which I'm seeing it is happening in Africa, big time in different countries, was important. So strong governance and delivery, and then a business uh, class, if I could say, that's coming in, creating jobs with ambition, and helps keep the pace uh, moving. And then, you, and, and, then, and then I think you let it rip. All right. And do you have a sense of the uh, entrepreneurial capacity in Africa from your uh, visits uh, uh -huh. here? What more can be done to uh, stimulate that, again, drawing on your global experience? I, I, I'm very excited by the entrepreneurial capability. And I've seen it in East Africa, in Kenya, Rwanda, in Uganda. You, you see you know, some of the youngest billionaires on the planet now in, in, in this part of the world. Uh, Nigeria, uh, in French West, there, there, are, there is talent that is out there driving things. I think what we need to do is, is have more of the entrepreneurial education and financial support. One area I worry about is the financial system is not as developed as it needs to be to support the SMEs. So that, that group of the yeah. companies going from, if I could call it, $1 million to $25 million in sales, which is what is where you generate a lot of the opportunity with a huge potential domestically, needs financing. And those, those, that, that part of the financial market is not deep enough yet. They are not getting access to it. The cost is quite high. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I, but I'm very impressed. And I think we, we've done some work to say, when we look uh, 20 years out at the largest companies on earth, where they're going to be, half of them are going to be, have come from the emerging markets, and about 20% of those are coming from Africa, right? So they're, then they're already there. It's just, a, you know, new, people here probably, probably know who they are. I'm spending time here like a, like a pig that looks for truffles, trying to find <laughs> these entrepreneurs. How can we support them? How can we help them? Because I'm basically looking for Peter Ma. Uh, for the, the, the who's right. there's many of them here. Right. Yeah. Well, what, what about um, education and uh, health care? How does that figure into your practice and also your view of uh, what needs to happen in Africa? Well, th those are two extremely important areas to be able to get, because it's human capital, and, and I, I'm a big believer that, you know, you can have a governance and a delivery system, but the focus on building human capital uh, is what's going to lead you to work. And I, again, I look at, from spending time in Asia, Singapore, uh, Korea, they, they have nothing. They have, they have no resources. They have, they've just got dirt in an island, if you will, in a place. Yeah. But what they focused on is the human capital side of things. If you look at them, primary education, what they've done in their uh, vocational uh, education to try and train people for the jobs that are going to be required. There's a much tighter link between, it's, we've got education for employment. So I, I think it's vital. That's a, I think I'm a big fan of infrastructure, but I think we should be putting even more emphasis on mm -hmm. education because you know the, it shows, we, we know the competitiveness of a country is very tightly tied to what your long-term performance is on the education. Yeah. Uh, one, one final question before we uh, throw it open uh, to the audience. Um, uh, McKinsey serves a lot of multinational clients, uh, Western companies that are uh, allocating resources internationally. 
Have you uh, detected any change in the relative balance uh, uh, in terms of Africa vis-a-vis -vis other uh, geographies in the last few years? And, uh, and in what particular sectors or cases do you think it's most uh, evident? I, I, definitely. It's a very, and that's why we have to take our own medicine, too, because if we don't do it, we're, we're not going to be relevant. And, but for sure. I mean, I, you hear many uh, CEOs of multinationals. Uh, Andrew Witte at GlaxoSmithKline Beecham has said this. Uh, Bob McDonald, when he was running P&G, basically saying the next CEO in our organization is in Africa today. It used to be Asia. Mm -hmm. So in my view, the new Asia is Africa. I think you'll see most leading-edge companies are trying to invest, figure out how to find talent, how to grow talent, uh, and how to grow their business. So it's a very high priority. And, and, and again, if, you, if you're in the consumer goods industry and you look at this middle class that's being formed right. here, and again, one statistic I always like to give, and I'll, and I'll get whacked by some of my colleagues if I'm out of date, but I believe that Nigeria will have more babies born this year than all of Europe combined. So if you're in the diaper business or you're in the consumer goods business, you, if you're not in Nigeria, I mean, what are you yeah. doing? And so yeah. this is where I think we're, we're getting that push. Okay, that's an excellent example. So let, let, let's go to the audience. And uh, uh, once again, a question uh, end, uh, uh, is a sentence ending in a question mark. Uh, who'd like to uh, start us off? Someone uh, in the audience, uh, please. Uh, yes, please. In the in the front in the front row, we have a question here. Uh, Samir bin Makhlouf, I'm the country manager of Microsoft. I apologize. I will repeat my question again that I asked a little while ago about the ecosystem. When you evaluate companies, do you evaluate the richness it creates around them from an ecosystem point of view? And what I mean by that is creating the whole chain, the value chain that will include other small businesses to serve that bigger corporation around them. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, that's a, actually a, a topic of particular passion, uh, this inclusive uh, capitalism. So not only we definitely look at the supply chain ecosystem or like the backward integration and the forward integration, doesn't mean they own it, but the businesses that they help support uh, that are there, that's, that's a key part. But we also look at what role does that business play in the society in which they're operating. You know, what, one thing I think for the entrepreneurs to remember, if you think about Adam Smith, when he, what he wrote in his first book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, he said the duty of the entrepreneur is to take care of the society in which they operate. Quite a socialist type of thing for old Adam Smith to say, but I believe it. And I think we've lost that a bit in the last 30 years. We just think it's shareholder value uh, you know, cut the costs, r raise the prices. You, you might blame McKinsey. We're seen as the Jesuits of capitalism. But I'm telling you, as one of the Jesuits, we need to broaden that. There has, it's a stakeholder role. What are we doing? And, because if you don't, you won't have a license to operate uh, in, in the particular uh, economy that you're operating in. And I think a lot of emerging market CEOs get that. If you're the CEO of ICICI Bank, you care about education not because it's a nice politically correct thing to do, because it, 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 it's required for them to be able to open up the branches that they need to and build the businesses in the rural areas of the country. So I, I, I'm very much into the broad ecosystem measurement. And you'll see pension funds that are now looking at that. The Canada Pension Plan, Mark Wiseman, you ask him, he will look at your footprint uh, that, that is there. The Norwegians and what they look, they look at your footprint uh, in what you're doing, health measures, not just performance. Is, is it possible, do you think, that in the Africa context there could be some uh, redefinition of uh, the capitalist model towards something uh, a little bit more longer term? I, I think so. I mean, this, this is a place that uh, needs the long term. And you think about the infrastructure investments, right? It's, in, I think, in the order of $21 trillion. It's, it's massive, right? And those are. Those, by definition, are long-term in, in what we do. Education, what you mentioned, or healthcare. These are not quick fixes. And so I think having, this is the, your discussion before on the sovereign wealth fund, I enjoyed, you know, that we need, we need strong sovereign wealth fund players that have a, their quarter is not three months, but 25 years. We need that type of thinking to be able to 
drive it. And, and I, would, I would actually, they can also, with the private sector people, be demanding as well about that time frame. Right, good. Uh, any other uh, question for uh, Dominic? Do I see another question? Yes, sir. Uh, I think uh, on the uh, left, Rob Herzog, yeah, please. Uh, Dominic, just maybe this is the take your own medicine thing that you mentioned in the beginning. How many offices do you have in Africa now, and how many of the 1,500 partners are based in Africa, and where are they based? And then to give you a little get-out clause, where do you see that in 10 years' time? Yeah. I, you know, uh, we have uh, offices in uh, Johannesburg, Lagos, uh, Luanda, Nairobi, uh, they're in, in Morocco, uh, Egypt, uh, I think Tunisia, uh, we have an, an office there. Uh, Ethiopia, yeah, Addis Ababa, sorry, I should get, and so th that's where we are. I, I think we're, we're only getting started uh, on that side. Uh, we've actually, did, we set up, as part of the changes I was making, we have an Africa office, because one of the things I worried about, Africa used to be part of the Europe, Middle East, Africa time zone. A lot of companies have time zone based structures, right. and the problem is when you get, in Africa we need to be investing. We have to, we're in, here for the long term, that's what we did in China, that's what we did in Germany in, in 1964. We have to invest, and so that, that's where we are. We're hiring, uh, the, uh, the number of partners that we have here I think is in the order of 60, uh, so it's not enough. The number of partners from McKinsey that work in Africa is about 170, um, which is bigger than any other firm uh, that's out there, but that, that isn't who we compete against. I think we have to compete against the opportunity. So we're hiring uh, at, at probably double the rate we need to because we're going to grow more leaders, and, and I, the thing I, I still, that's probably not enough um, given all the opportunities. Okay. Uh, what, one, one more question before we uh, end uh, the gentleman in the second row, if we can have a mic, please. Uh, brief, brief question, please. Thank you. It's on. Go ahead. Hi, can you, okay. Hi my name is uh, Jan Pembu. Uh, I'm a managing partner at Africa Bridge Capital. Uh, one question that I have for you is, um, as we know in Africa, there's a very limited amount of uh, data available to do proper analysis. So how does uh, McKinsey bridge the gap uh, to collect the data to do proper analysis so that you can actually advise your client appropriately? Well, I, I would totally agree. I mean, I think the getting uh, accurate timely data is a key part. So what we've, we've had to do is actually gather our own data. We did this in China, which John actually knows, because the Chinese consumer was changing so quickly, and we're, we're big fans of people like Nielsen and others, but th it was very difficult to gather accurate information, so we built our own database, uh, which we now, by the way, provide to clients. And they don't, sometimes the clients don't want the people. They said, it's very nice, McKinsey, but we don't need your people, just give us your data. We're comfortable with that. So we are building databases in all of the 21 key sectors, and we're building a database of all the consumer, the African consumer, right? How they're changing because they're they're changing so quickly that doing, you know, once every two year reviews of where they are is not enough. You have to look at what's in people's, uh, you know, refrigerators or cold boxes in terms of what they're buying and so forth. So we are building data, uh, and we actually believe that's a new service line. One of the things we're where I also think McKinsey needs to change is how we work with clients. We've had too traditional of a model, which is based on, you know, a project team for six months to work on any issue. That's not very flexible. And sometimes people just want data. Sometimes people want software, a capability. Sometimes people just want training. Some, sometimes people want people to be seconded. So the data is a, is a big push. All right, terrific. Uh, Dominic, thanks Thank for uh, sharing with us. Uh, Please, a round of applause for uh, Dominic. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome journalist, Conseil Supérieur de l'Audiovisuel, Christine Kelly. Mm -hmm.